All right. Thank you so much, Dan, for like that. Okay. I think. Thank you. So that was very. Uh, <coughs> Dan and I have looked over what he had uh, just presented, and it's, a, it's a really a fine uh, kind of theoretical foundation for what we try, what we attempt to do in clinical. I'm going to try to give. A, the po a point of view from, I'm a clinician, I, uh, I've worked in private practice for, for really many years, um, and uh, a very busy private practice, very large group practice, so we saw a lot of patients come through in northern New Jersey, and I currently work um, in, a, in a state prison where I treat inmates in our mental health department, so much of, you know, what I say is kind of uh, relevant to the current experience. So, let's see, let me make sure I got it. Okay, so let me approach the clinical work from a, kind of a takeoff of what I mentioned before about what is the scientific method, and that is clinical psychology and psychiatry is dedicated to both understanding the cause and effect of a particular behavior, and, we, and that backs up diagnosis. We look at the conditions that are responsible, causal, for certain behaviors, anxiety disorders or depressions or psycho, you know, uh, antisocial behavior, pedophilia, those kinds of things. And we say, okay, we, we, we kind of understand that, and here's the, here's the behavior. And then we, we give it a diagnosis based on the criteria that is in this little book that we live with almost every day, most clinicians, uh, the DSM or the Diagnostic Criteria, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual that gives us the whole list of diagnoses. Well, from there, we make certain predictions. We say, person who meets this particular profile, this particular picture, based on criteria, behavioral criteria, you know, two out of three or five out of uh, ten criteria, have this problem, and the likelihood is they are going to behave in a particular way. So we make certain predictions. We'll see. That becomes, and they, they, those are hypotheses, so to speak. But that's a real challenge, as we'll see, for clinicians. And then the issue is we move our area, and our focus is to render, get to the third area, which is the applied area, control. We want to control, frankly, the frequency the intensity and the duration of certain behaviors, symptoms. Okay? So we apply, in our own way, the scientific <coughs> method. And we want to be scientist practitioners. <coughs> That's the model that has been uh, at least advanced and encouraged by uh, organized psychology, American Psychological Association, and that is base your uh, practice and your treatment methods on science. Between us, it doesn't happen very effectively. Science doesn't get translated again into good clinical practice, as far as I'm concerned. And, I, and I'm not alone in this, so I hardly dreamt this up. This is the thinking of a number of people who looked at that scientist-practitioner model. Yeah. So, but we also notice here that um, this is here. See, abnormal. We're, we're, our focus is abnormal behavior, but we also are concerned about improving already existing normal behavior. You know, we want to know, you know, why people are being effective, and we want to help them to become even more effective. So it's not just a focus on abnormal. That that is our stock and trade, so to speak. Um, and so it's this third activity of control or treatment that I think, uh, you know, I, I said before, most will wince at this idea that, you know, it is a control uh, uh, activity that we're involved in as clinicians. Yes, we want the patient to essentially exercise self-control, get control of their obsessive compulsive symptoms, so they are not interfering with their functioning, get control of their levels, their intensity of their anxiety, so it doesn't interfere with their 
functioning, get control, and know the triggers for the depressive reaction. So again, it doesn't interfere. Or the, and how, to, how does that happen? Well, that becomes part of training people for self-control and also medication that addresses some of the uh, dysfunctional, uh, what I consider modules. I, I think Dan's right on when he talks about you know, massive modular theory of, of the mind that somehow goes awry in mental disorders or you know, behavioral disorders. We call them behavioral disorders. So it's not always mental illness, but behavioral disorders kind of subsumes an awful lot of uh, what it is we define as the content of clinical psychology. What is it that we, we, we address? Yeah. So our focus as clinicians is on proximate cause, what's <coughs> causing this behavior now? You know, is it environmental? Is it something that went wrong and, and, and awry in the modules of the mind that processes information? Schizophrenia, uh, pedophilia, perhaps obsessive compulsive disorders or, 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 or sub features of, of those disorders. Now, now uh, Dan mentioned and uh, rightly represented that the adaptionist, adaptationist approach is really not the full explanation for why uh, mental disorders come about, behavioral disorders come about. And he, and I'm not going to go into it again. I, I, when, I, when I originally uh, wanted to do this, I thought I would do it, but Dan covered it in good, in good stead here. Balancing selection, and then, of course, Keller and Miller's uh, paper on mutation selection or mutation load uh, is an important issue for all of us. Now, you know, do we all have this mutation load and pre or predisposition within us for certain disorders. I think that's a debatable issue. I don't, I don't accept that that is the case, but that there are some people with, who inherit certain gene, genetic predisposition, their alleles are such that, like alcoholism, you may have a predisposition for alcoholism because you're of your genetic makeup, but as long as you don't start drinking alcohol, it doesn't get triggered. So gene expression becomes a, a, an important issue so that the gene environment interaction is so important here. It's not by genetics alone that these behaviors are determined. So you do, you, you have to take into consideration that predisposition, but within the right local environment. So that, that becomes a, ma a major factor. And, and, when we, and we know that people with, whose family history is such that there is schizophrenia in the family history or alcoholism in the family history are statistically more likely to develop those disorders given the right interaction with the local environment. You have to be exposed to a certain trigger in the environment in order to have those genes expressed. Now, from an adaptionist point of view, I do want, I do want to get back to this just for a moment because there, there are many, I think, disorders that can be viewed as that adaptations gone wrong, and, and I think we'll see that. Uh, we, we, from my point of view, evolution gives us a sense for what is a baseline against which we can then uh, make a decision and assess deviations from that baseline for either the good of the person or to their detriment. And this is one way to look at it. Yes, ask not for whom the bell curves. I had borrowed that from somebody else. I didn't make that up. <laughs> but, you know, this is an oversimplification, of course, in terms of human behavior. And you couldn't possibly get it on one screen. Uh, but if you take a look here, we, we have the mean that accounts for 68% of the distribution of any particular behavior. Uh, if you move at, within one, one the plus and minus one standard deviation from the mean. And as you move out, you add on a little bit more, all right? And as you get to the extremes, you begin to see, from a negative 
standard deviation point of view, you get into what clinically would be referred to as abnormal. From an adaptionist point of view, it's maladaptive. On this side, on the positive, if you look at the, on the right-hand side, positive standard deviations, of course, again, very much oversimplified, you get, this is normal going, here's normal, going out this way, gifted, and then highly adaptive. So at the extremes of the bell curve, you, what you get are the extremes of either normal behavior or abnormal behavior. This is just one way to look at it. And it does represent a kind of normative frame of mind that clinicians use when we're doing diagnosis, defining the problem. Because before you can decide, define a solution, you've got to def define a problem. Now, and so it gets us a diagnosis. For me, evolution puts a focus on the function of behaviors in light of their survival and reproductive value for the person. And this has to do with their ability to solve problems in, the, in a comprehensive sense of their inclusive fitness for themselves and their offspring. So, now this little book, I reference it here. It has a lot of shortcomings, and I'll mention a, a couple. It, it, it's, it's atheoretical, it is uh, founded on almost no science. Stitch and, and really, really, Stitch and uh, Murphy and Stitch, I think, do a great job in their chapter of taking a look at this, and they talk about this little book here that we use to diagnose and treat people and get reimbursement from insurance company is really founded on a lot of folk psychology. There is no, there, there really are no well-defined clusters of, and, and unified clusters of behavioral problems that are listed in this, this little volume. It's a bigger volume. This is the one we use every day, but there's a bigger one that goes into much more theory about this. And so, there's a great debate over this. We were lucky to have uh, the, the Jerry Wakefield come out last year to New Paltz. Dan was very instrumental in getting him out there. And, uh, and he spoke about his own diagnostic work on the harm dysfunction diagnostic system that talks about you can only uh, define a disorder, a mental health disorder, if it has an evolutionary basis, that something goes wrong in a naturally selected uh, mechanism in the brain. Now that can happen in a couple of ways. One is through biological insult, injury, brain injury, or toxic you know, chemical injury, uh, or it could happen through malfunctioning because of environmental factors. But uh, he, you know, he's been he's been having this long, frankly, long-term debate back in first started really in nine, 1992. It has a very He's frankly friendly with the people who put together the DSM, Spitzer in that group, but they don't, he doesn't seem to have much impact on their willingness to really adopt some, uh, a more theoretical and certainly evolutionarily founded uh, basis for diagnostics. Now, we'll see what's going to happen. This is a DSM, this is a DSM-4, uh, and, and there's a new DSM-5 that is due in, uh, I think, May of 2013. 2013, and it, it's kind of hard to say how they're going to change this to see whether or not they can put it on the foundation of some science, and especially evolutionary science. I have my doubts, really. But, it, okay, so it, it does, you know, it's flawed. It omits any clear evolutionary foundation from, you know, if you're going to look at it from an evolutionary point of view. However, there is a scale in this little book. And with evolution and, it, and its, and its uh, emphasis on function, defining behaviors in terms of their function and their, and their, and their evolution uh, in terms of problem-solving function, there's one aspect to the DSM that I like in that regard, and that is, it's, it's in here, it's one of the first things you come up against when you do diagnosis, and that is the global assessment of functioning scale. The global assessment of functioning scale, which I put up here. I went through the whole thing. You know, I just, uh, 
and you see here, if you're at 100%, 100 percent there, you know, uh, you, you consider all the, here's 100 percent, superior functioning, you know, looking at that bell curve, again, all the way to the right side of the bell curve, you know, you got, you got superior functioning, you know, and no problems at all, no symptoms. Okay, you, then you get a little bit, you know, uh, you move out a little bit to the extreme of the first standard deviation. Really, no minimal symptoms, a little anxiety, a little of this or that, you know. Now, and as you move down, okay, you begin to see if symptoms are present, you know, transient, okay. Some mild symptoms now, okay, uh-oh, where do we have to get to before we start treatment here, okay? And, but, but take a look at, take a look at what it says. I mean, no. Yes, you've got difficulties, school, occupation, functioning, okay, function pretty well. So, meaning some, okay, here you get down here now, moderate symptoms and school functioning, conflict with peers and coworkers, okay. And, and now you have some serious stuff. Now you get down to here, now you're talking, right? Coleman knows me. We're going to talk about him in a minute. Uh, serious symptoms, suicidal ideation, severe upset. And you go down here, some impairment in reality testing, major impairment in work, school, family relations. I mean, I see nothing in all of this that in any way, you know, look at this. Here, here's the worst of it all. Okay, this is hospitalization time, where if not before, it would be suicidal ideation. We put them on suicide watch in prison. Anyway, all the way through here, you see all of this more and more severe to the point where, you know, serious suicidal act, clear expectation of death. Okay. Well, I mean, that, that certainly is a sign of, you know, damaging your inclusive fitness. There's no doubt about it. Okay, but there's nothing in the DSM that directly references criteria founded on behavior that decreases inclusive fitness. Nothing... I mean, it, it seems to me so simple to, to add those things like that have to do with mate selection, mating intelligence. And there are indirect references to impaired survival fitness. I mean, yes, suicide, very clear. I mean, you know, the, the expectation of death that somebody doesn't want to live any longer, and we do get that. There's no doubt that we get it. And the, the issue is it needs to change. So that, that's just diagnosis. That's just defining the problem. Okay? So, but we have a ways to go. Now, take a look up here. Here we have, uh, how would evolutionary diagnosis, who contributes to the definition of a better diagnostic system? We have Wakefield that I mentioned, he spoke last year. We have Coleman Glantz and Pierce Noma, but Coleman is right here in the audience with us. And he, as far as I'm concerned, he wrote one of the most important books in the field and, and, I'll, and I'll mention this more in treatment about the treatment aspects, Exiles in, 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 from Eden, that talks about uh, mismatch theory in particular. <coughs> and that's saying, Williams, you know, you know why we get sick and, and other, uh, you know, more adaption, uh, adapt, uh, adaptationist approach. Our own Dan Glass, I read a paper by Dan on obsessive compulsive disorders that I think has the potential to contribute to a better diagnostic system in the DSM for that disorder. I think Dan laid out very nicely you know, the subcategories of this disorder that have treatment implications because you'll treat different types of obsessive compulsive disorder based, you know, you'll come up with a different treatment plan, different correction, a different proximate intervention to change it depending on a more refined look at OCD. It's not just OCD, different kinds of OCD, safety issues, cleanliness issues. Um, and then we have, uh, it, it, there's a paper that Dan and I, Dan uh, Kruger and I, re re reviewed by uh, Keith McDonald that I hope will be in our JSEC <coughs> special edition talking about conduct disorder that again looked at, and it's very relevant to the work I do in prisons, and that is, there's a category, for example, called uh, um, callous cold-hearted conduct disorder, which is very different than other conduct disorders. And th those are the conduct disorder people who cannot have empathy for other people's feelings, and they victimize, they're predatory. They're, they victimize others for their own gain, 
without any consideration for the uh, you know, the, 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 the problem, uh, the, the pain for other people. Uh, Murphy and Stitch, I think, also talked about it in, in psychopathology. Blair, there's a, there's a researcher, Blair, who, who looks at this in terms of problems with inhibiting violence because you inhibit your violence when you see somebody in pain, if you hurt them, you back off. Well, the callous, cold-hearted psychopath doesn't back off. It doesn't arouse in them moral disgust, like, ooh, look at that poor person in pain. No, I, I, gotta, I better stop this. No, it doesn't have that effect on them. So what goes wrong then, diagnostically? I like the modular approach to the mind uh, that uh, a number of uh, theoreticians uh, put out there, Sperber and, and others, a great review, what is it, um, Kurzban, and, uh, I forget who the other guy is, but the, somebody in Kurzban, I actually have the paper with me, but they, they review the material on mo the modularity issue, and I think it really comes out that there's really something to it, something goes wrong with these modules that we as clinical people have to address, to correct. And, okay, uh, who else? Richard uh, Mac McNally at, at Harvard um, has, a, has a book out, What is Mental Illness? And uh, a really good book. Uh, actually, Dan put me, he doesn't know what probably, he put me onto the book when I reviewed his paper. <laughs> but uh, a really, really terrific job that he did. And I, I Murphy, uh, a stitch. Well, okay, I, I missed a few letters there. That's it. <laughs> Forgive me. And that's what I talked about that. But so the challenge of prediction is, is one of, um, you know, how do, we're not very good clinically at, at predicting. And I have a feeling, though, that if we were more evolutionarily based, we could probably predict better because we would look at some of these behaviors differently. And I'm going to skip through this a bit. Uh, but one of the things is statistical prediction based on norms is more powerful than human. <coughs> Meal, the author of the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory, is uh, one to look at statistical models for prediction and outcome. And everything I've read as a clinician says, hmm, I have to say that this statistical approach needs to be taken into consideration. And clinicians don't do that much. You know, uh, while we have your gut feeling, it's fine, but if you can back it up with some statistical norms that said, you know, uh, I think I have something on that. I mean, we, we look at this, you know, I call it the prediction commitment bias, and the stronger you believe in a prediction, then you're going to be biased in a particular way to use a particular intervention or treatment. Uh, and you're going to say, well, here's a callous, cold-hearted CD male, which I have in our prison, 18 to 30. Uh, you know, is going to uh, act out uh, 0 0.5, 0 0.85, you know, 85% of the time, I can predict. That's pretty high prediction. Same thing with, we, we, we see a lot of SVPs are uh, sexually violent predators. And we, we pretty much know a, pro a profile, you know, repeated uh, offenses. Uh, they don't distinguish male or female if they're incest. Uh, the, the sexually violent predators, they don't even make a distinction for kin. So these are dangerous people. So, you know, what do you do? Based, based on, you know, your, 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 your prediction, and that's based on looking at the history of the person, as a treatment practitioner, you're going to say for these two people, these two types, long-term incarceration. Long-term. Megan's Law for SVPs in New Jersey. If I, say somebody is going to be considered by the Attorney General's office, the AG, uh, for civil commitment, he's got to go to a special hospital, and he, he, may be, he may do time for life. That's the way it is, to keep that person off the street because they're real danger. Others I will recommend for community uh, connections, they'll re wear a bracelet, you know, and they'll be monitored by uh, GPS, and they can't go near certain places, zones like schools or children's playgrounds and things like that. So. We're talking about a lot of surveillance. Um, yeah, let me, let me uh, let's see. Yeah, th this is important. You know, uh, we look at people, they're disturbed. Something's wrong with them. And their disturbance is such that it interferes uh, and, and impacts their own inclusive fitness. Let's take somebody schizophrenic. 
and their inclusive fitness is damaged. They, they don't have good mating intelligence. It looks like they may not get married, they may not get children, have children, etc. They're disturbed. But it's interesting that those who are disturbing, you know, you've heard this distinction before, they're disturbing to other people. And what happens when people are disturbing, you know? <coughs> Kids who are ADD, ADHD, um, people who are depressed, people who are phobic and agoraphobic, they don't want to go out. They're on their way to a wedding and they say to their husband or their wife, I can't, I'm going to have a panic attack, you got to go home. And I've had this happen with patients I've treated, and they turn around and go home to avoid a panic attack. Okay, well what happens? Well, what these people, they're disturbing and they, they impact others' inclusive fitness. Well, they don't, they don't arouse compassion right away. Many of them arouse avoidance, they're rejected, they're ostracized, hospitalized, incarcerated, exiled, some are killed. And you get abuse of the disabled, as you will read about in certain institutions. New York has that going on right now, and uh, I forget where, I forget Rhode Island or one of the hospitals is now have a class action suit against. We have it in our, our prisons, I can tell you, but we do. Um, oh, let me go. So, uh, you know, compassion is not easily, not necessarily the first emotion that's triggered by maladaptive behavior. People don't want to be around other sick people. They're not attractive. And so it flies in the, you know, again, this is evolutionarily based if you look at it. So compassion, you know, for some, it's easier, there's a gender difference here. It's easier for women, very frankly, females. But males don't tolerate that very well. <coughs> that might be a research issue. Uh, okay, treatment. Let me try to get to it. How are we doing on time? Yeah, soon, okay. Well, treatment it becomes the issue, and and, and why? What, what's what's treatment? You know, um, Glance, Calvin Glance's book here, uh, I, I like very much. I recommend it, and I and I I, I use it a lot. Uh, you know, makes a case that this, what psychotherapy is, the therapeutic relationship in clinical work, it's a social activity. It comes closest to social interactions in our ancestral environment. Okay? And it will address mismatch because those environments were more predictable, more consistent, and eventually more trustworthy. And they resulted, and, and, and treatment, the treatment setting confirms innate expectations based on evolved ancestral environments. And it's a trusting relationship, psychotherapy, the corrective, whatever you do in psychotherapy, but that's not enough. That's not enough. You need a set of procedures, corrective procedures, but it has to be embedded in a trusting relationship. And from my perspective, an evolutionary basis for psychotherapy is that it does. That, that relationship between the patient and the, and the, and the clinician does uh, set up a trusting relationship, or it should, or something's wrong. Okay. Anyway, we have mismatch here. What, what evolutionary science does for me as a clinician, it, it, it sets up a dichotomy. And I look at behaviors that are either the result of mismatch between the problem-solving modules that are naturally designed in ancestral environments and the problem is presented in the novel modern environments and you get role conflict. Uh, and we can go into a bunch of those. But, and, and, and essentially, it says that much behavior is situational, so it's situational diagnosis, and you you treat, excuse me, the, you treat the person in relation to its, his environment, so that his problems are situational, as opposed to those that are bio dysfunctional, which means the problem solving modules, okay, are due to either physical injury. You might remember Phineas Gage, you know, took out part of his frontal lobe and he became a very different person from the mild-mannered guy he was. He didn't become Superman. He became, uh, you know, very, very uh, antisocial and almost psychopathic individual. Genetic damage, okay, inbreeding for various reasons. I think, I think inbreeding depression among humans has yet to be looked at as a real issue here. Um, uh, and then uh, 
you know, cultural experience here can damage, uh, you know, uh, the person. But the but the, the problem lies within the person. It's dis it's part of the person's disposition, not their situation, and that has to be addressed in the kind of therapy you do. Uh, resolving the conflicts, mismatch. Um, again, I don't want to go over time, but again. This, this book here I would recommend to any uh, clinician who really wants to know how to address a mismatch. It's really terrific. Uh, let's see here. Okay. Modules, okay. When modules go bad, and, and Wakefield is big on this with the harm dysfunction diagnosis that leads to certain treatments, you do need, okay, to address the craving system. And I don't think we've looked at that enough. That's an evolutionary um, uh, system. Uh, that, you know, is the dopamine reward system that's responsible for addictions. I think it gets involved with obsessive compulsive disorder to aggression. And the one thing that I try to do in therapy with these kind of impulse, impulse control disorders, essentially is what we call them, is to help a person not reach the point of inevitability. There become, there's a point at which when you get so angry in anger management, that you really can't stop yourself. You just, you're going to go on. You're going to act it out completely. So the issue is prevent helping someone develop the self-control to avoid the point of inevitability where you have to take that drink, act out that uh, aggressive behavior uh, or pedophilic behavior. Some, some pedophiles can be helped. Some, most can't. Uh, and so Issues like, and we know there's, an, there's, a, in, there's a defect in, 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 in impulse inhibition, yeah, and, which is probably free, prefrontal cortex based primarily. Uh, and we know the amygdala that signals for uh, the kinds of emotions that we experience. We call it a hot amygdala. We want to cool it off. Uh, response prevention. Don't let the person do that obsessive compulsive or the, the, the compulsive behavior. Prevent it. And what happens? They do reality testing. Over time, they are testing reality and seeing, how about that? This thing I've been afraid to do or the thing I've been compelled to do doesn't have the consequences I thought it had. So through pr response prevention, probably exposure and response, uh, and response prevention is probably the most effective treatment for obsessive compulsive disorders. Um, and same thing with some anxiety disorders like panic attacks. Anyway, and, and here, when you, you get, you certainly you give medications that address directly the module that's dysfunctional. And in some cases, they're not curable. So it's long-term incarceration. That's it. Thank you. I hope I didn't go over. So, question for Dan. And Yes, God. Just two comments. Uh, what you're talking about, the Cal's fellows, I recommend for those of you who, who haven't seen it, there's a great documentary called the, the Psychiatrist and the Iceman. The Psychiatrist is Park Dietz, who's a forensic psychiatrist. I've seen it. It's, it's, it's incredibly powerful it because when you're talking about lack of empathy, there's a scene in that, in that in exchange where the uh, serial, the, the murderer, is basically retelling how he used to torture animals as a child, which is a typical precursor of serial killer. Right. And when the psychiatrist asks him, well, how did that make you feel? I mean, this is really shocking stuff. You don't have to be an animal lover to be completely recoiled in horror. He simply was unable to understand what the psychiatrist was asking him. What do you mean, what did I feel? I, I took puppies, I put them in the oven. What's, what's the big deal? <laughs> right. uh, the second point I would make is regarding OCD. I, I published a paper a few years ago where I looked at sex differences mm -hmm. in OCD symptomatology. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if you look at ruminative thinking, intrusive thoughts, mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the intrusive thoughts that men have will be very different from those that women have, precisely in line with certain sexual dimorphisms. Mm -hmm. So, that I say something stupid at yesterday's <coughs> party and everybody thinks I'm an idiot now will be something that men will ruminate over. Uh, am I likely to harm my child when I throw him over the balcony? Mm -hmm. That would be much more of a female instantiation of OCD. So you might want to look at some of 
Uh, so well, could you bump. send that? I'd like to see I'd that paper. Send that yeah, send it to us. Please, because it's, it's very much aligned <coughs> with what you're saying. Please, and I have a, I have a data set that we could actually replicate that finding. Okay. On my computers. Uh, Gad, do you discuss this in any of your three books? Uh, don't worry, I'll, I'll be talking about Excellent. my three books next. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I guess I'd like to put to you guys the, the idea of rewriting the DSM, right? Yeah. Um, Which Sam likes to do. Especially because, you know, I mean, you probably have to do it either, either you'd have to connect with someone really powerful on the inside or do it from the outside because it's such an institution. It would be quite hard to, you know, change something that monolithic. But I guess just to kind of frame the question, you know, so the five axes that are in the DSM, how much of that would remain? So if you create something that's based on, you know, modular form as, as you propose, how much of the five axes still really belong there? And how much gets reshuffled? And what what in your thoughts, and I know you probably haven't thought too far through this, but what in your thoughts does a rewritten DSM, an evolutionary DSM, look like? I want to say something general, and I want Nick to take the specifics because I'm not trained in this. Um, a lot of people, as you probably know, have a lot of problems with the new DSM-5, the previews that have come out, right. for a lot of different reasons. So people from different orientations all have Almost, it's almost like the same problem for different reasons. So the, the problems that we, we addressed, you know, constructivist psychologists say, well, you're assigning, you're assigning reality to these theoretical constructs. So there's all this. So in fact, and, and the old DSM crew, some of the old DSM crew has even written this letter to the new DSM crew. And so um, a lot of people are jumping from it, like rats from a sinking ship. And it's possible that if, if enough people scurry away from the DSM, that everyone is going to create their own theoretical uh, uh, guidebook, and, and so it might even be the case that you don't even have to rewrite the DSM if, if enough people don't like it for enough different reasons, you could start anew, which is something that we've sort of tossed the idea around maybe after this workshop where we can, you know, have some more time on our hands, we'll actually start talking about serious attempts to do that, so what do you think? Well, I, I know Dan has proposed this, He's, he'd like to get a bunch of people together to Take a look, and you know, he's doing a classification now, right? You're doing some classification. Yeah, it's a different, it's a different project, project, but, but it's, it's related. Right but it's related. So what would remain? I, I, you, you, we could probably retain each of the five axes, and if for the, 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 the axis one is the one we treat most people for, which is your, you know, uh, anxiety disorders, affective disorders, uh, depressions. And, uh, Behavioral disorders, childhood disorders, ADHD, uh, there's a whole slew of them. And, and they're the ones that come into our office who want to be there. You know, either uh, the, the access to is our personality disorders, what they call personality disorders and um, uh, retardation. And those are usually people who are more disturbing than disturbed, okay? Those who, to, to, to benefit from psychotherapy or and treatment, you really have to have some anxiety about your problem. Gee, I have a problem and I don't like it. Okay, so sociopath or, or uh, personality disorders are characterized ordinarily by people who are saying, I'm perfectly fine. If other people would change their behavior, I'd be great. It's their problem, not mine. Don't treat me. Change the world and I'll be fine. So, you know, so uh, now, uh, from an evolutionary point of view, both of those would change significantly, in my, my view, if you put an evolutionary foundation to who we treat, Axis one, and who are sent for treatment by the courts, or, you know, somebody said, the school says you've got to get help or you can't get back in class, the judge says you go to therapy or rehab or you, you know, you go to jail, they're forced to come, you know, hard to engage. Uh, Axis three is medical complications, which we almost never, I've, I've never, I don't think, Calman, have you? I mean, I, I don't think I've ever used the axis three to define a disorder, for me, anyway. Obesity. Obesity, could be, that's right, but I've never done it, but I don't think in those terms, axis three. You know, axis four are transient kinds of things that are called adjustment disorders. We see a lot of that in prison. Guys having a hard time, never been in prison before. I don't know what I'm doing here. I, I, I shouldn't be here. I'm not supposed to be here. I'm innocent. You know, I'm not supposed to be here. Many of them are. If you believe it or not, they are innocent. So there are a lot of crazy things out there. Axis, the fifth axis is the uh, global assessment functioning scale. 
I think it would remain. But I'm asking, and I think others are asking, that we redefine in terms of function based on evolutionary principles. So the, the, what you'll see in there is disturbances in behaviors that interfere with a person's inclusive fitness, very broadly defined, but, you know, go down the criteria for that. Yeah, you know? can, I, can I jump in there? Yeah, sure. It would strike me that such a manual would include such things that would probably be all put into many such things, <coughs> potentially homosexuality, potentially asexuality, potentially someone who doesn't want a nurse for the language which we probably did back in the day. So I understand the functional aspects of it. I imagine such an endeavor would probably get a lot of heat from many people. It could, but homosexuality, as you probably know, is taken out of the DSM. Oh, no, I know. I thought I'm talking about oh, an yeah. evolutionary informed one. An evolutionary informed one, respect. don't forget, it has to, that, that's a very <coughs> sticky wicket, because yeah. if you look at inclusive fitness, you have to redefine it. Sure. Is, do homosexual individuals contribute to the inclusive fitness in their life? My answer is absolutely yes. Well, the evidence on that is, is, is equivocal at best. Well, I understand, but do they make a contribution to the betterment of the human condition? And now you're going to have to, for me, redefine and define more broadly what inclusive fitness really means. So, so, uh, look, many people, heterosexual or homosexual, aren't interested in their, in their kin. And they don't do anything for their kin. They don't contribute to the inclusive fitness. They don't care about their fellow man. But if inclusive fitness was talking about the family of man, genomically, it seems to me, you know, you're talking about a very different kind of inclusive fitness. It gets beyond Hamiltonian, you know, uh, coefficients of relation. I'm just wondering, Dan, have you thought about that at all? Some of the repercussions, if you will, of evolutionizing? Absolutely. Um, it's that, that particular concern in general, so if you, if you, I don't know if you've heard of Wakefield's harm, harmful dysfunction sure. model, which uh, I think was, so, so Wakefield says that for something to be considered a disorder, to be correctly considered a disorder, it should have two parts. It should be, first of all, it should be a dysfunction in a, in a naturally selected um, part of our, of our mind um, or, or body. And it has to be harmful to somebody, to, to the person or to society. So. Um, if any, any work that I would be involved in, uh, we would be involved in, would, would have that framework. So um, starting from the idea, well, if something is, if we don't consider it a disorder to begin with, then you know, we don't have to say that it's, that it's, it's a problematic. So, so you're retaining kind of the personal distressful or distressful or harmful to others. Right. And, and you know, there, there are critiques matters. of that too, but I think that right. that's a great starting place. Got it. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Israel. Um, just pacing up, just going off the idea of uh, I guess normalcy. Is there an evolutionary perspective that you're basing it off of? What is the normal? So how do you define everything else around it if you have a central point of what actually is normal? Well, I do know that at least in the clinical literature, it's been the, the idea of normalcy, that from an, uh, defined from an evolutionary point of view, has been very controversial. It, it essentially says that evolutionists are trying to tell us what ought to be, you know, that old fallacy, that whatever it would be, uh, yeah, the, what is it then? The naturalistic fallacy. Naturalistic fallacy. And, you know, from an evolutionary point of view, are evolutionists trying to say, we know what's best for people, and then indeed, go back to the normal curve that I had up there, the, 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 the bell-shaped curve, and we're saying, in the, in, you know, in that 68%, plus and minus one standard deviation, are evolutionists the one who are going to say what's normal, and then any deviation from that is abnormal? So that's a scary thing, I think. And I do believe that people who are putting this DSMs together and things like that know that. I think that, that evolutionists are, are threatening to the mainstream clinical psychiatry and psychology. I just want to point out that the, the Baba is in the house. <laughs> oh, okay. So I, we're, we're about 20 minutes behind now. I think we should probably. Uh, I just want to add something. Yeah, to yeah go ahead, please, 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 please. I feel like 20 minutes. Okay, go ahead. Um, uh, I personally uh, would likely be considered uh, not necessarily maladaptive, but yeah, actually totally maladaptive because oh, nice. I never want to have kids, fuck children. 
um, I think they are a little demon spawn. And uh, because of that, I mean, we've had just a plethora of ridiculous illnesses in the DSM since its creation. Uh, and I think part of the reason why people are afraid of the evolutionary perspective is because if something's maladaptive in a very broadly divine sense, like I don't want to ever have kids, then, oh, that's abnormal and thereby diagnosable. Right. So that's something I want to talk about. could for. very well be. And that's right. And I think that's part of the controversy. And I think I, was, I would refer again to the harm to dysfunction. Sure. Yeah. Whether she finds a person distressful or others do. Yeah, I think that diagnosis is really a, a tool to help you understand the person, not to tell the person what to do. And what you're doing in psychotherapy is you're trying to help you, the person is telling you what's wrong. You're not coming from a diagnosis and saying this is what's wrong and I'm going to make you conform to this. They, they come to you with the problem. They don't know often what, why they have that problem. And the evolutionary perspective can tell you why they have that problem and it can also tell, give you some hints as to how to make it better for them. It's, it's, not, it's never a question of, oh, you fit this diagnosis and therefore you have to do this way or that way. Right. That, that just doesn't happen. And, 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 uh, especially on mismatch, much of what we get, the really seriously mentally ill folks, we don't get in psychotherapy. Right. We might have supportive therapy and help the family deal with the the exactly. mentally ill person, but they're usually on medication, and it's basically 